I get a lot of questions on the channel about people for from people who want to do solo RPG but don't want something that is based in kind of traditional fantasy or that is a D&D derivative and my answer is Troika. In this video we're going to look through some of the amazing material that is published in conjunction with this game and indeed the game rules themselves and I'm going to talk about a number of reasons why I think Troika is such a perfect game to pick up for the soloist. This is a traditional tabletop role-playing game. I'll say that at the outset. It is not solo based and indeed there are no like solo rules. But the way the game has been put together, the approach of the designer, the philosophy of creation of the world is done in such a way that it is a natural fit for solo play. And this video is going to talk about a number of reasons why I think that's the case with Troika. And in so doing, I'm going to show you some of the many available modules or little adventures that are published in conjunction with Troika that you can use to create either one-offs or campaign style play as a soloist. Reason number one has to do with character creation and what that entails and the, the concept behind the characters as well as how you create a character. And we'll see here at the outset to just situate ourselves in the world of this game. Troik is described as a science fantasy RPG in which players travel by eldritch portal and non-Euclidean labyrinth and golden sailed barge between the uncountable crystal spheres strung delic delicately across the humped back sky. What you encounter on those spheres and in those liminal places is anybody's guess. The idea that each world is both separate and connected is embodied in the way character creation works. You are rolling a d66, so in this case we'll call that a 51, and you are looking up in the book your character background and what you are getting from that we'll see in a moment it says they're everything your character was before you got hold of them they provide you with skills possessions and other special benefits where noted slide into the role and make it your own so in the case of 51 we will turn to this and see so we have 36 options here in the main book 51 everybody gets an illustration a description possessions and then skills and this is the this is the the nexus the where everything comes together in terms of how your character operates in the world we have a skeptical lamas lamasa lamasu with the body of a bull, the head of a man, the forelegs of a cat, and the wings of a swan, you are the sweetest of the children of the gods. You, however, were not content to rest on your cloud and instead descended from the heavens or crawled up from the abyss and set about finding your own path among the stars. You have incidental sacred jewelry worth this if you trade it. You have a pillbox hat. Your claws does damage as a sword. Your hooves does damage as a club, and you could fly as fast as a running man over clear ground. And here are your skills, including three random spells that you get to choose, and your fighting ability here, and your ability to fly. This is a actually a great example of the variety, the feeling of a character. It's a kind of mystical, magical, amorphous, yet anthropomorphized character here and with the spells there are also in the book the spell list I think there's also 36 spells here so to roll up the random spells it's the same same deal everything here is based in d6 so we would look here our first spell is going to be century let's see what that is it sounds pretty good and it's all just organized really nicely to down to the thoughtfulness of the different color pages so that you can see the different sections in the book that the rules themselves are on this kind of blue 
page and then the spells turn to this or the advanced skills turn to this kind of purple and you know, here are the spells in the purple here so spell was on 66 and let's see what our spell is the wizard plucks a bit of their mind out like candy floss and leaves it stuck to a wall somewhere this psychic presence is invisible to the naked eye but extends the wizard's senses to that spot for the duration. While at last the wizard suffers minus one to all rolls due to the incredible confusion this generates. If the shard is discovered and harmed, the wizard loses 2d6 stamina due to the shock. You can see that there is within that a lot of room to determine what it would actually mean if somebody's mind is somewhere. You can also see how this is very narrative there's a thought behind this spell description that is almost the beginning of a story or could be to imagine playing this character with that spell and let's roll up one other spell and see what how it would work with a 42 the 42 is going to be hurricane and hurricane the wizard waves their hands in the air like they just don't care, which being wizards, likely they don't. A mighty gust knocks everyone over within 30 meters who fails to test their luck or skill for enemies, dealing 1d3 damage and making an awful mess. Lasts for 10 minutes, test luck every turn if not taking cover or else take further damage. So that's, that's a little bit more traditional. And let's look at uh, 65 is a warding spell, a handy spell only requiring the flick of a wrist. In response to being fired upon, the wizard may cast the spell to cause the missile to be deflected. So we have some spells there that will round out the character here in addition to their skills. And now let's just let's just look take a look at one more character. So we're back to uh, character 32, Journeyman of the Guild of Sharp Corners. You're an assassin in training, graduated from fighting dummies and branding practice clients, freshly imbued with a license to ply your trade. You haven't fully developed the idiosyncratic methods required of a master, but you are on the path. You have black clothes of the apprentice, a garrot, a curved sword, three vials of poison, a crossbow, and six bolts, and these are your skills. So the way the game works is the mechanics itself are quite simple. You have a baseline skill level, and in this case, it's going to be a 1d3 plus 3. So basically a range just from 4 to 6. And you are adding that to any advanced skill values you may have if you're using that skill to come up with a number. And then it's a roll under with a 2d6 for the success. The entire system is based on d6s. There's no other dice required in the game. So for example, in the case of, let's say our baseline skill here was a four, if we wanted to use our poison skill, we would need to roll a five or less on our 2d6 for success. And that's the way, that's the key mechanic of the game. For opposed rolls, which would happen in cases, in various cases in the game, you would be rolling your 2d6, adding your skill value, and then the higher value would be the one to succeed. There are a couple of other stats that you have. There's a stamina stat, which is a 2d6 plus 12. That's your stamina. And a luck stat. Luck is something that you can use up in the game. It is a finite resource in the game, and you can use luck for various things. And we'll turn quickly to the mechanics here, the rules, because really in I want to talk mostly about the, the rules here are pretty easy to understand, and we already went through most of them. Sometimes there's going to be a luck test, and you will test your luck and have to roll equal to or less than what your luck score is and every time you test it whether you succeed or fail you have to reduce it so eventually it will run out uh, but after you rest you can regain it so it is something that um, you can use in combat if you choose to to 
add to your damage roll, for example. If you reduce your stamina to zero, you are in danger of dying and you need some healing and you can regain stamina by sleeping. But if you ever go below zero stamina, you are dead. And it says when you die, you can immediately make a new character. You mourn your loss, other people fight over your possessions, and you keep going. So there is a sense here that um, not that the characters are inter interchangeable per se, but that there is there are infinite, perhaps, characters that you can play. It's probably a better way to think about it. And for the... For the soloist, I think with the limited number of the, the limited range of skills, for example, whether you're playing one or more characters, you could decide to just start out at maximum skill for the baseline skill level. And then as a sort of house rule for making things easier for yourself, especially if you're playing the game where you're running a lower number of characters. The concept that the, the, the books give you characters that are already imbued with story and already are within the worlds that are created is one which advances solo play a lot because it's starting you out with a story. So here we're looking at um, one of the supplements, very pretty Paleo, Paleozoic Pals, Permian Nations. And this is a dinosaur adjacent, I guess, world here. And the humans are coming into this world and they are big bullies and taking what they want. And again, you can see with the beautiful production value on really all of the books that um, I have here, the use of the various colors of pages to delineate different parts of the book. In this case, this we're into the location world here. But I want to show you, we're focusing here on the, the character creation. And in this sense here of this book, we also have a the same thing that there's, it's called the character guide. And these are numbered and you can roll up to create a background. So in this case, it's a 1d6 and a 1d3. And let's just take a look at what we get here. So in this case, we would be a newly, no, we would be a keeper, keepers of a cord. There are many flavors of surprising asceticism amongst the smiling Xenoconthus sharks. Cooperation is often negotiation. Concession and compromise are expected. Those willing to concede their whole lives to the case to the cause of Europidus Accord are known as keepers. Through sacred fast, strange rituals, and perseverant conviction, keepers gain entry to the air. There you and your brethren swim, that the land may be kept in accord with the water. So you can swim into different areas to keep this light of harmonious accord shining. And you have things like a bucket of mud clams and a high quality braided rope. You have skills, navigation, etiquette, and a couple of spells. Let's take a look at um, what you can also control your rope as a spell. So let's take a look at some of these. You can manipulate the rope as an extension of your will. The rope's strength and general efficacy are equal to the stamina paid to cast. So there is a choice to be made when casting the spell about how strong you want it to be. That's a very specific kind of character that goes into a very specific kind of world. And part of what makes Troika as a system so compelling are the vast variety of different worlds there are. Here we're going to take a look at another book, Acid Death Fantasy. And in here it says, the slate was not wiped clean. It was shattered into countless jagged pieces, splintering a new world with the debris of the old. That is the flavor you get for this setting. And again, a familiar layout with printed end papers and some of them having D6, D or random tables and the art here. And again, we can see in this thin volume how much of it is devoted to, we have D66 backgrounds and the same thing mirrored with the enemies. And we're going to get to that in a moment, but here sticking with the backgrounds, let's just 
take a look at one background here, 65, a deposed sultan. What is a ruler without dominion? Nothing. This is what your possessions are. This is who your adversary is. And you have a bodyguard or a scheming eunuch or a sorcerer held in thraldom with you and some advanced skills here. Just the variety of what is on offer for characters really seems like I'm rolling a lot of fives and sixes with these. A tortoise dweller survivor. In the deep wastes, tortoises the size of towns wander, decimating oases wherever they are found. Rather than attempt to race the tortoises, your people settled atop them, slow-moving pirates of the wastes. Something killed your mount, your family, and you were left alone. And this is your advanced skills, including vengeance, for example. So it is, for lack of a better word, just very evocative. The, the concepts of the characters are incredibly baked into the variety of the settings. And the last thing we'll look at here for this character discussion is the volume Academies of the Arcane, which is in essence a, it's almost like, I don't want to say Harry Potter, but I just did. It's creating a magical academy and everything in here is going to support doing that from details about the type of school it is and things of that nature to the spells and of course again the characters and once again we have another g66 table of possible characters so character 43 is a cursed character let's there are few greater crimes than the destruction of art you were once the sort to topple statues into rubble you never expected a statue to shove you back, carve out your heart, and reforge you in the soft Promethean clay of creation. In the strange space between object and man, your two sides vie constantly for dominance over your petty frame. You're special. You don't breathe and your blood does not circulate. You take double damage from fire and heat, which cause your body to bake and become brittle. You must concern consume dirt mud or clay to recover stamina and you have a clay-like skin shifting spear-like limbs and a heart of clay and blood you also have some spells let's take a look at the uncanny self spell useful for those of the fashionable mind and the narcissistic the wizard of their target appears perfectly normal regardless of whether they are or not on fire have a hatchet through their throat or a demon freshly hatched from their chest no matter what, they appear to all the world like they've just had a shower and a decent meal. So this is a, uh, again, somewhat open-ended spell. It seems like you could cast it on yourself, you could cast it on a target, and that target would remain normal to the world even if they were afflicted with something. So the presentation of characters as they're called backgrounds. I call them sort of packages. And with the, the narrative so baked into the characters, I think makes it extremely easy to roll up two or three characters, place them in relation to each other, and set them forth in the world that you have chosen to inhabit for your game. And that world, that concept of the different worlds brings us to point two. The second reason that Troika is so great for the soloist is that if you pair it with any of the books that are supplements for it, you get an entirely different experience, an entirely different feeling, world, goals, story, and you can pick and choose among so many of them to to play a world that you want. So we'll take a look at some of them here. This is, and again, all of these, the link to all of this material is below. There's a couple links below that um, will allow you to see how you could get all this material yourself. So we'll just take a look at this one here, the Andrew Walters Franz of Benevolence. Duke de Corticus is dying. The peaceful linchpin Duchy of Plandra is under threat. 
its quasi-arboreal ruler is starved of his esoteric earths, sedition is rife, assassins glint in the shadows, and green ink is everywhere. The quest to restore stability takes you to the rainbow badlands, across the precipitous face of the wall, and into the very vaults of the hump-backed sky. It's a, it's a chapbook adventure for Troika, best suited for groups of four to six characters. It sounds like it's just this, you're just dropped into this entire world here. You have uh, open up again, very good use of end papers here. There's rumor tables and a map and the rumor tables are divided up. So you use one table when the party is further north than south and one when they are farther south than north. And we get some familiar, we'll take a quick look at the credits here. We get some GM advice, how to get started in it. And the story is, in this particular case, there is a timekeeping aspect to it in terms of how you are traveling through the world. And the you're journeying on a, a space barge in this particular adventure, and you are given some mechanisms for conducting combat with it and how it would do damage, as well as what is the case in, in all of these supplements, groups of NPCs and enemies, we'll take a look at them, some random situations, and a location, the emptied city. Again, you can see that a lot of what is offered here, or really almost everything that is offered here, comes with some description, that we're not just really focused on stats at all, we're focused more on a description of the NPC or of the enemy in the context of the world. And each world is just very self-contained in that way. And that is part of the conceit of the game, that there's just these different, different spheres of existence that may be completely different from one another. So here is the a slow sleigh to Plankton Downs. And in this, this is a, a very different world here. We open up with a map of this it has a key and um this is a whodunit aboard a the nantucket sleigh ride as they attempt to un uncover the truth behind the mysterious murders plaguing the ship will they reveal the culprit or suffer a cold lonely demise on the face of the unforgiving ice now at first glance it, you'd think it would be hard to run a mystery per se with uh as solo and that's, there's a valid there's a valid point to that, but you could treat this as a dungeon crawl because you're in a contained environment here, and you have lots of random tables to help you create NPCs with features and preoccupations and names and different uh, map that you can travel through with different descriptions of the characters that will be in this place and you could randomize this for yourself and have encounters and you could also just read this as a story that the the a lot of the modules almost feel like you could just read them as if they were like a type of choose your own adventure book where you're just reading through you're not actually doing the encounters but you're just reading through the the things that do that you could be encountering and it feels like an adventure story for lack of a better word to pull this into a game session will allow a ton of diversity for you to create a place to explore basically like a place of exploration whether the conceit of the story is a murder mystery or the exploration of a kind of vast wasteland where you are as in as in this case almost like a wasteland desert where you are just encountering tons of enemies and things it, because it is so narrative based and if you look at the table of contents here you have all these 36 backgrounds with these 36 enemies 
you have for the enemies the same kind of presentation. They each have their own reaction table. So you could, in this case of this of this module here, Acid Death Fantasy, just create a party traveling through and having encounters. And because you have these different types of responses, it's not necessarily just going to be that you're fighting every enemy, that you could create a narrative story. If you came upon this rock bore piling up bones, you could investigate perhaps what they're building and why and take that as the basis of your story. And because the enemies are created in this fashion, it allows for a, a very enlivened world and one where you have to just discard your preconceived notions of what an adventure may be. The Fungi of the Far Realms is a source book and it is a D666 book where you can roll 3D6 to come upon an entry. This is like a scientific, we'll look at 432, this is like very much a scientific explanation of fungi in a world and it is simply presented for you to do what you want with it in terms of description, art, flavor. We rolled up the monster leg fungus. Now, one could use this, I think, very effectively as the beginning of an entire adventure or story. This lives in the deadwood. It's a gray, a dry gray crust fungus that will cover a chopped down tree trunk so completely it will appear to be a single enormous gelatinous creature. The presence of them often results in local constabularies to put out bounties on imagined aberrant beasts living in the woods. If you ate it, it would be very dry and flavorless and it has an indistinct aroma. The suggestion here of what this could mean is it's just a story seed. It's a story seed from a fungus entry, really. And it just if that sounds weird, well, this is described as a weird fantasy sci-fi group of settings. And that is indeed what you get. The fact that you have, like, this could be presented as a document to somebody sitting around a table, but as the soloist, this is like your reference library. And perhaps this is something that you turn to at the outset of a game to just set set out your story. How to use this book? Well, first, don't use information in this book to help you identify real mushrooms because this is fake. Simple answer, if you want to look for a mushroom, you can do your role. The more complex answer, as I say, is that it is it can be used to reward players who enjoy exploration. Finally, a less simple answer. I don't think there's anything wrong with supplements or whole systems that are closet dramas, that is, written only to be read, not performed. I wrote this with the intention of it being used. Think of this book as a narrative grit. If your world is too clean and smooth and useful, with everything having a purpose and a reason, it will be boring. Imagine worlds need need texture to be fun. And this book can inject a little of that into your game. And I think ultimately that's going to lead me to my third point about this game. But let's, before we get there, let's look at 151 and just see what mushroom or fungi 151 is. This is a blossoming earth star. Oops, sorry about that. A blossoming earth star. It lives in Cyprus. External covering is a well camouflaged gray brown with a spore producing gleba being darker, almost walnut colored. It grows in large colonies that will release their spores within a few days of one another. The pink spores will make whole areas of woodland appear to be covered in a colorful, sticky snow. The flavorful it, flavor and mouthfeel is insubstantial and indistinct, and it smells like summer fruits. Again, you could just read this and think about it or t take it for its kind of feel or theme of perhaps something imagined that is happy or gleeful and pair it with something that you're working on in the the wizard academy here perhaps maybe you have a maybe you have a character who is a young wizard and 
in this case, they are a tiger conceptual. You are someone possessed by a tiger and it lurks in the forefront of your mind and drives your frame to predatory bliss. It will devour you over time and become all that is left of you. I don't know. Maybe you, maybe you have a, your story is making a solution to that to try to save yourself. And this fungi that is offering a wondrous new world is the site of that savior that becomes your savior and you travel through a world to get to that place. I don't know. It is a system where you need to allow your mind to go to places that are not going to be the familiar fantasy tropes. This is not in that space at all. And that is really the gift of what it gives you is the freedom and the permission almost to just completely think of developing these stories in foundations that are completely unfamiliar. And I think this brings me to my third point about why Troika is such a goldmine for the soloist. The setting is almost, it's implied in a sense that it could be whatever you want it to be. And the books are certainly the basis for that, but it gives you a springboard for your imagination. It is colorful and dense and varied and all over the place. And you could see that from the art direction to everything that I've read you so far in the content of this material. And as such, it epitomizes, I think, something that I have talked about in terms of solo gameplay and written about in terms of solo gameplay, which is that every interaction you have as the solo GM, one of the mindsets of the solo GM is that every interaction you're having with RPG rules is playing the game. That just reading rules and reading books, I think these transcend for in, in my feeling about these supplements and even in my book, The Solo Game Master's Guide, I have a list and a discussion of 10 mindsets of the solo GM, which I think is so important to understand as an approach to solo gaming. And mindset number one is that everything is playing. And by that, I mean that every interaction you have as a soloist with a rule set with RPG materials is an aspect of play. You could think of it if you want to put it into the framework of traditional Role playing as that's the GM portion of the game. So when a GM is working with materials to come up with their notes or plans for a session, they are playing the game. They are doing an aspect of role playing. It's prep, but it is part of role playing. But as the soloist, that is a full aspect of what solo RPG is because part of the time, or all of the time, you are part of a GM as, as well as you're part of the player. I can't think of any other rules and worlds that are associated with rules right now on the market that provides the full experience of reading a book that really just transcends the fact that it's a rule set as does Troika and its supplemental material. That just picking something up and reading it, it's it's the experience it of the rule set, yes, of the RPG, yes, but it is almost like reading like a choose your own adventure book or just some crazy fantasy experience that is has nothing to do with RPG. That is just a world in and of itself. It's it's hard to explain until you actually get into one of the supplements or even the main book because it's so rules light and narrative heavy that it just feels like you're reading a story and going through just sequentially reading about all of the different characters and letting your mind wander into what this could mean, the gremlin catcher. And the well, we already looked at this journeyman of the Guild of Sharp Corners, the member of Miss Kinsey's dining club, that 
it's like you could use this just as the basis for almost like a thought experiment in living in this world. I haven't even mentioned the extraordinary art you've seen throughout this video. No, sorry, I got cut off there when I was talking about the art. As I said, it's not just the cover art in the books, which you have seen and which is really glorious, but the art throughout and the overall attention to detail in terms of the production quality of the books, the use made of the end papers, and the really rich reproduction inside in terms of the vibrancy of the color, the variety of the art, and the way in which it supports the story that is being told by each book. So for these three reasons, I think Troika is a great place for soloists to go if you are looking for, as I said, first of all, a world that has nothing to do with D&D or those types of fantasy tropes. Forget mechanics, just the, the concepts and ideas and freedom to imagine a, I don't want to say a parallel universe because it's not a singular universe. It is universes of places and ideas and worlds for the, the freedom to explore imaginatively. Troika offers that. And for the type of solo support that is built into a non-solo rule set, but one with ample, not only random tables, but character concepts, character backgrounds, packages of characters, and narrative baked into every description of every spell, every description of every item, in addition to the characters. Troika is an excellent, an excellent place to go for all of that.